All right, welcome back to another episode of Obsessed with Death. Thank you so much for continuing to listen and support the podcast. Please continue to share and spread the word about the show. It helps a ton. Leave us a review, leave a comment, share on social media. All that stuff is incredibly helpful. My guest today is Sheldon Solomon. He is a renowned psychologist and professor over at Skidmore College whose groundbreaking research dives into the effects of the uniquely human awareness of death and our behavior because of that. Basically, this entire conversation is about why we do what we do, why we react the way we react, and how basically... All of that is because we're aware that we're going to die one day. Probably the smartest person I've ever spoken to in my life. The dude is a legit genius, and I can't believe he took any amount of time to speak to me and come on the podcast. You're going to love this episode. It's by far one of my favorites of all time. So please enjoy another episode of Obsessed with Death. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, I would love for you to maybe just give the people listening a little bit of an introduction, you know, who you are and and what it is that you do. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Sheldon Solomon, and I'm an experimental social psychologist by trade. I teach at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, and For the past 40 or so years uh, with my colleagues, we have been studying basically the effects of conscious and unconscious death thoughts and anxiety about death on all aspects of human affairs. It, it, it of course, is is really why I was so interested to speak with you. I mean, the, the fact that you've been doing this for so long is obviously so interesting. This whole podcast is really based around the fact that I'm just looking to have more conversations about death. It's something I think about a lot. And this sort of became like the outlet for me and and a way for me to find other people who are willing to have these kind of conversations. Do you feel like there's like a, a middle ground on how much you should be thinking and focusing on death and how much you maybe shouldn't? Yeah, I do. Although if I could answer that question precisely, you know, we'd be on a beach somewhere chugging rum out of a coconut <laughs> with a Nobel Prize. But uh, sure. yeah, I, I think that's a really wonderful way to put it. I, I mean, to back up for a bit, I, I've been preoccupied with and disinclined to die since I was like eight years old, the day that I realized that it was going to happen. And so I have a personal stake in these matters that precedes uh, you know, our academic interests by several decades. But to make a short story long, I think that for the most part, the average individual uh, goes to extraordinary lengths to uh, spend most of their waking moments uh, just cheerfully oblivious of the reality of the human condition. Uh, And, um, you know, to borrow a phrase from Pink Floyd, that makes us comfortably numb. uh, But it also brings out the worst in us in that malignant manifestations uh, of death anxiety when we kind of bury it under the psychological bushes it, it comes back to bear malignant fruit and so for example in our work uh, we find that when people are reminded that they're going to die in very subtle ways that uh, it makes us more prejudiced it makes us more likely uh, to vote for populist leaders uh, like hitler it makes us uh, disinclined to agree that we're animals it makes us like spend money carelessly at the expense Uh, of the physical environment, it makes us more likely uh, to have amplified symptoms of psychological disorders. And so those are all terrible things. Uh, And uh, there is uh, very solid evidence that, uh, you know, borrowing from Albert Camus, who said, come to terms with death, thereafter, anything is possible. 
I, I think we could make a good case that a mature confrontation with the realities of the human condition, you know, can get us to the point, I like how Abraham Lincoln put it when he said, it, it's not the years in your life, but it's the life in your years. And so I think that's the, the good news is that uh, we can, uh, by focusing attentively to the fact that we're transient entities destined to someday uh, be obliterated. On the other hand, um, that we could go to the other extreme, and that is to be so preoccupied uh, with the inevitability of death that we're literally marinating in intimations of mortality. And that also reduces us to piles of psychological rubble. So back to your original question, which I thought was great. Yeah, I think we have to get into a place psychodynamically uh, where we're willing to have protracted engagements uh, with our mortality without becoming obsessed thereby. Yeah, I definitely feel like there is a minor obsession sometimes, an unhealthy obsession that I'm that I'm dealing with. Me and too. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, and I don't know really where it came from. I, I mean, I remember, th you know, th it's one of those moments in life where I remember exactly where I was when I realized I really am going to die one day. And it, it was just this wave of fear and anxiety. And I, I it was like my mind just exploded in a way that had never really happened before. And I think I'm I'm getting better, but yeah, it's it, it it always interests me to get, you know, other people's opinions on especially, you know, people that are like you that are that have been working on this for so long. Not not to sit here and be like, please fix me. <laughs> like I, I don't think I don't think that's possible, but it does help when when, you know, you could you could speak to somebody and, and they could sort of give you um, a little bit of an insight into what I guess, you know, I'm kind of feeling. Uh, I'm curious about something. I, I was speaking to somebody recently who's in the death world. They're studying to be a doula and and something that they did during their practices was they created a, they created a death date as in this is the day that I'm going to die, quote unquote. And they lived a year of life with this date in mind as if they were going to die. And something interesting that they brought up to me was that they felt like at points they were almost uh, attracting death. I, I would just, I'd be curious about your opinion on, on that sort of teaching method and, and if you think it's possible to attract death with your thoughts. Wow. Uh, that's another one of these uh, potentially Nobel prize <laughs> acquiring <laughs> questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. I, um, I am aware of these kinds of, I think, well-intentioned efforts to bring out the best of us with regards to living in terms of how we engage uh, with dying. But I'm not so sure. I can see, uh, you know, having like a specific death date. I could see that influencing people in a variety of ways, including the same person in radically different ways at, at different moments. So, you know, for example, I, I, I do see um, allegorically, if I knew I had one more year to live, I, I could see in principle that making my life extraordinarily enriched because I could see every day uh, as like, wow, you know, that's that 365 minus one uh, as we're counting down. Uh, on the other hand, what some psychologists point out, and I see this too, uh, that could also be devastating. Most of us, as we go through life, um, I like how the Heidegger, the philosopher, he says, when everything's going well, we're always filled with anticipatory resoluteness. We're always happy in the present because we're foreseeing where we want to be heading um, in the future. And, and I could see, um, you know, having a, a death deadline uh, being kind of a flaming stick in the eyeball of somebody who's always looking forward to what's next. So I guess I could see it both ways. Yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting way to live your life. 
and 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 it it made sense, I guess, in the fact that they were using it as a tool for this career that they're moving towards. Yeah. Um, but it seemed odd to me in the sense of like giving yourself a date only in the sense that like, well, we're all go going to die. Uh, of uh, I think that there's obviously it, it felt like cheating almost to, yeah. to, to like put a date on it. Oh, when I get it, it. When it's like, shouldn't we all <laughs> just be living? Because we all have a death date. We don't know it. We're not lucky enough to be able to, you know, mark it on the calendar. No, but, that's right. Yeah. No, and and so, uh, you know, so I, I've been trying to learn a little bit about theology lately. And a Paul Tillich, a Protestant uh, theologian of yesteryear, used to talk about the notion of eternity. Uh, and his point was that eternity is not a, a quantity of time. It, it's basically a feeling uh, that one has in different phenomenological states of awareness and that, you know, when we're really at our best, uh, you know, we're so firmly situated in the present moment. I like the the example of like when you're a kid and you're outside playing and you're so deeply involved in what you're doing that like six hours go by and you look up and it's dark all of a sudden and it literally seems like lifetimes uh, have passed. And so I, for me, I, I think that, you know, having like a, a use by date uh, would really unsettle that possibility. I'd have a hard time getting up uh, in any day without being like all right let's take one day off the board they they look at it as you know the, this teaching tool i i would just see it and i would just see it more as yeah just a countdown I, and, and it did seem to help the help them in different aspects of their life whether it was focusing you know on relationships and family and it's i don't know i i just thought it was an interesting tool and it was it was something that I, that I was unaware of up until you know I I had this conversation with them a few weeks ago. So uh, I don't know. I thought it was I thought it was an interesting way to, to live your life. But that the that idea of uh, attracting death seemed uh, interesting me interesting to me in the fact that there's people like me who who are think I don't think I'm attracting death, but I do think that. There, there is, and I'd be curious, you know, to hear your your thoughts on this as well. But I think if you do focus a lot of your energy and your thoughts on anything, there is some sort of weird, almost cosmic attraction that you that you bring to it. But I, I don't know. That could just be being paranoid. No, again, an interesting point. Like a, a the novelist of yesteryear, Sherwood Anderson, who wrote a lot about death. On his tombstone, his epitaph is life, not death, is the great adventure. And so what I'd like to think is that uh, at our best, and I'm not proposing that uh, we're like this all the time, but I think these ongoing cogitations about death that we share with uh, those around us are really uh, where it's more that in, in confronting death, maybe as corny as it sounds, we're really embracing life. I think that's what the goal for me sort of is, at least a little bit, is, you know, creating relationships with people through these conversations and in, in a sense that's sort of enriching my life a little bit. But at the same time, I, I'm definitely guilty of just needing to really talk about this stuff and and just seeking out people to do it. I, I'm curious, you you know, you like you mentioned earlier, you've been you've been in this world studying and 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 researching for forty plus years now. Have you noticed a, a change in your perspective on death? W was there ever a moment? during you know this time in your life where you know something sort of clicked and and maybe changed how you thought about everything or or, or has your perspective so, sort of stayed the same throughout all of this well you know that uh, no, again another great question this is awesome i i uh, would like to think I'm, I'm 70 years old that i'm making some progress towards a, a mature relationship with the reality 
of my own finitude. So I, 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 I hope I'm not just a twitching blob of psychological protoplasm cowering under my bed, groping for a large sedative like I used to be. Uh, and, you know, that I, I'm kind of making progress uh, on that front. But I also, uh, what I've realized of late is that, you know, for 40 years, uh, my buddies Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazinski and I have done experiments uh, where we have tried to show what happens when people are reminded uh, of their mortality. And we there's thousands of experiments now that uh, show that conscious and unconscious reminders of death have these uh, very poignant and profound effects on a wide range of attitudes and behavior. And, you know, so we've been doing that for 40 years and people have asked us, well, you know, what has that done to your own feelings about death? And it took me a while to step back and to realize uh, nothing. Uh, It's kind of sad, uh, but that, well, for 40 years, uh, by doing experiments uh, about death that spared me the challenge of actually having to think about it myself and only recently have i begun to step back a little bit and to try and say to myself well you know how how would i know uh if i'm making any progress and i and i don't know that this is true for everybody but uh, what I've started to think of late is that on the one hand, I'm, I'm proud of some of the things that we've done as academics. It, it's nice that uh, we've written some books and done some podcasts and that people are interested uh, in our ideas. But uh, I'm also at the same time uh, really, uh, uh, what would be the right word? I'm really attracted Uh, to uh, another uh, line of thought that I think the existential psychologists call it experiential appreciation. Uh, And another group of folks call it cosmic insignificance, where they're like, hey, uh, you know what? Uh, The reality of the human condition is that you're born in a time and place, not of your choosing. You're here for a microscopically short amount of time before you're summarily obliterated. And while that might Uh, make some people feel terribly distraught, it's actually, if you view it from a different perspective, tremendously uplifting, because what that suggests is that almost anything that we do is potentially valuable and that we can imbue it uh, with meaning and value. And I'm, I'm ranting a bit, but I guess what I've, what I've tried to uh, come to the point is where I can appreciate writing a book and I can also appreciate getting a breath full of fresh air on a nice day and walking the dog around the block. And to me, I'd like to think that that's kind of a sign that I'm making some progress uh, towards a, a mature relationship with my own mortality. And that's just to appreciate the very fact that I'm here and respiring. Yeah, I love that. I think there's a ton of value in both, right? Like being able to be able to create with, with colleagues and write these books. There's so much value in that. And and you're providing to so many other people. And then there's a ton of value in getting some fresh air and going for a walk. And I I think you could, you could gain a lot of perspective from both. Right. That's right. No, I'm curious, you know, you you talk about these different experiments that you're doing and, you know, obviously I'd love to hear more about that, but it also just makes me wonder if you feel like in in this this time of of research that you've done, is there an area of research or or an area that you you feel like deserves more of your focus that just never really got the attention it deserved? Is, Is there a part of of your work that you feel like you you could have focused more on or or, or was there a reason that you sort of distance yourself from that area yeah i'm just i'm curious if if there's certain areas that that maybe you feel deserved more focus than they got no no really a uh, good point so our our focus for uh, literally 35 of the last 40 years 
uh, has been to point out kind of the malignant manifestations of death anxiety. So, you know, when we remind people that they're going to die, they hate and harm people who are different. And and um, so if you remind um, uh, uh, Americans that they're going to die, uh, they're uh, more eager to use chemical and nuclear weapons against countries that uh, don't threaten us. Iranians reminded that they're going to die are more eager to become suicide bombers. If you remind people that they're going to die, they're more eager uh, to vote for fascist politicians. If you remind people that they're going to die, uh, they deny that humans are animals and they're more destructive towards the natural environment uh, death reminders make people more greedy, uh, and so on and so forth. And so we we have basically, in many ways, uh, provided support for Rob, this guy, Robert J. Lifton, who was a psychohistorian uh, in a book called Destroying the World to Save It. Uh, he just said that, you know, we may have the ignominious distinction of being the first form of life to be responsible for our own extinction, if we don't realize uh, how much death anxiety uh, underlies a lot of humankind's most unsavory characteristics. I, but we did all of that uh, really at the expense, uh, in retrospect, of kind of turning things around and saying, OK, how can we use these ideas uh, to help people come to terms with death anxiety? And in so doing, foster both personal growth and social progress. And, you know, if we had another 30 or 40 years, um, uh, this is where I'm almost certain that our research would be going. Right, but the good news is that, you know, when science is working at its best, uh, other people get interested in ideas and then they uh, adopt their own research based on it. And what's very exciting now uh, is a, a lot of research uh, that is looking at ways to help people uh, effectively come to terms uh, with their own mortality. I'm relatively new to this world. I've been doing the podcast for a couple of years now. Right. And it does seem that m maybe it's just because of the Internet and the ability to reach people people that you, you you necessarily weren't able to reach or get in contact with before. But there really is this like death world that has been created. Like it's like becoming, oh, I don't know if pop culture is the right term, but it's sort of getting like a pop culture-y kind of vibe to it where, you know, people are embracing death and creating these like book clubs and movie. And it's just like, there's all these things where it's just like, it's all, everything is death related. Do you feel like that's helping th this this uh you know this feeling of of anxiety and and fear of mortality the the little bit that I've thought about it community does seem like a positive thing yeah but, but again I I always just sort of worry about overthinking and like you said there there are so many negatives that come with thinking about death and being aware of your own mortality. I guess I, I I'm I'm just curious on your your thoughts on you know creating communities around death. Yeah. So my thought, and to get back to the earlier point, and again, I, I like how you put it earlier. There's there's a sweet spot where uh, to be engaged and to be connected, I, I see as potentially maximally beneficial. I I when our book, The Worm at the Core. Uh, was published in, I don't know, 2015. I was on uh, some kind of like book tour in England where I got to go uh, to a death cafe uh, mm -hmm. for the first time. I, and I, I didn't know what to expect. And I was even a little apprehensive that it was going to be some kind of morbid, toxic, goth-like Jimmy Jones death cult. Yeah. And it, it was not. It, it was an extraordinarily uplifting confluence of interesting people who were eager to connect and to be able to express their concerns about death in the service of enhancing life. 
And so that's the good news is I, I think that uh, that's important. And then like anything, uh, I, uh, you know, to be maybe a little glib, it is generally the case that a lot of good ideas, once they can be monetized and bastardized, uh, can uh, be reduced to either, you know, superficial and ineffective or, or uh, take on some kind of cult-like aura in sure which case it's non-optimal. So I guess that would be my view, but certainly uh, an interesting uh, cultural phenomenon right now because it, Western civilization is arguable, arguably, uh, you know, the most death-denying uh, culture in the history of Earth. So most people, you know, in North America, have never seen a dead person. A lot of them have never seen an old person because, you know, they're all in Florida and stuff. And uh, in America, we spend more money on cosmetics to make us look young uh, than we spend on like education and social services. And so, yeah, I see the, the death positive movement uh, as a timely and important counterpoint to the you know the really toxic death denying cultural worldview that prevails in the west and um yeah i hope good things come of it uh, but just like you know uh basically um you know and, and again i'm sounding kind of glib but you know a lot of folks uh they're vegans and they do yoga but there's more to life than tofu and down dogs and and that kind of thing and I think sometimes, uh, you know, in uh, an effort uh, to uh, like monetize and to kind of reduce these processes to things that can happen very quickly without much effort on the part of the practitioner, that they become bastardized as a result. Is there an age that we should be talking about death? Do you think that there's a, 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 a point in your life where you should have to see a dead body? Um, should we? be creating some sort of education for the fact that we're going to die one day? Absolutely, although I cannot with any degree of certitude specify when that ought to happen, if that makes sense. You know, uh, you know the fact is, is that, I mean, right now, this, uh, uh, we don't want to drift in a political direction, but uh, uh, anybody that's a big fan of either education or democracy should be concerned because it's getting to the point where it's illegal to tell uh, grade school kids anything that's true. Uh, yeah. So it'd be hard to uh, legislate that we should be talking about death, let's say. But what we do know is that kids are aware of and concerned about death long before uh, their parents think so. Uh, there's a woman named Susan Anthony, I believe, who in the 1950s, she was a British psychologist, and she did interviews with kids and their parents. And, and basically she just asked kids how they feel about dying. And then she asked their parents how they feel their kids feel about dying. And so anyway, to make a short story long, they asked both the kids and their parents, what would be worse, dying or doing poorly on a spelling test? And the parents said, oh, my kid doesn't understand death. They, they would be terrified about doing poorly on a test. But that's not what the kids said. Uh, at five years old, they're like, who cares about spelling? I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. So we do know for sure that these existential concerns predate any effort on our part to attend to them. Moreover, we know from anthropological studies uh, that, that younger people are included in bereavement rituals and ceremonies in other cultures. And what that does suggest to me is that we do a disservice to our kids uh, by pretending uh, that death is uh, the arbitrary and not always necessary. Yeah, I always thought it was so interesting. And I think maybe it, it could be shifting a little bit uh, you know, as these generations and and I think, you know, my generation and, and so on continue to get a little bit older. 
Yeah. And, you know, we become a little bit more educated and open about things. But I always did think it was so interesting, especially maybe when I was a, a, a child, how little credit <laughs> children get for things. That's right. right. Like like the like you like you said per perfectly, you would the every every parent or most parents would assume, oh, my kid's going to be way more concerned about a yeah. spelling test than <laughs> death. As if their child has no concept of what life and death is, just right. just just assuming so based off of an age. Yes, and I think we're getting to a point. Our I'm at least hopeful we're getting to a point where I think that that is sort of going away a little bit. I think people are becoming more aware of just how aware children are, and I think the internet, obviously, and there's just so many different ways for kids to learn things at a younger age that I think that that's going to help. I, I was lucky that when I was in high school, I was in, I, I was taking anatomy and I had a teacher who was like very, very much. Let's go look at the human body. Like took us on a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Showed us. I mean, there was a dead, there was a covered dead body in the corner of the first room we walked into and wow. it was like mind blowing to me, but it really did change my entire perspective on so much at such a young age, just from not even seeing the dead body, just knowing that it was there. That's right. That, that these things are, are, are exist and that are around us. I just, it, it, it was something that stuck with me for my entire life. And again, just sort of goes back to now where. I would I would love to see and and sort of like you said I think it would be difficult to really convince people to maybe have like some sort of death class. I mean we have you have a sex education class. I don't know why you couldn't also have a death class. That's I don't right. know if, yeah, I don't know if you need to do a whole semester on it, but you know, maybe a, a couple of classes I think could help. I really appreciate, you know, the, the the time that you're giving me and and this is sort of something that we ask everybody on the show and Obviously, this is your your life's work. This is your career. You focus on death. But I am just sort of curious on a non-professional level. And I don't know, maybe this is a crazy thing to ask, but I'd love to ask everyone what their relationship with death is like. Obviously, this is something you do professionally, but are I mean, are, are you thinking about it? every day on a more personal level you know if if we could just maybe shrink it down a little bit to just you and your life what is your relationship with death like yeah. are, are 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 you are you worried about it do you do you think that this is this is it this is all we got i mean what is your relationship with death like uh it's really oscillating and ambiguous because I vacillate between thinking that I'm like the paragon of psychological equanimity because I have finally come to terms with the reality of my finitude. And then other times I, I have like a faint or not so faint recollection of when I was eight years old and, and realized that I would someday die. And then because I, you know, I'm pretending to be a psychologist and I'm like, wow, death could be on our mind and we may not even be aware of it. I, I, I feel like uh, it's a really tough question for me because I, I have no doubt that it's of great concern to me now as it was when I was eight. Uh, I have no doubt that I will die someday, and I have fewer days left than I did 70 years ago. I think I have no doubt that I'm very much loving life and that I see that as an indication uh, of a, a stable a and functional interaction uh, between myself and my demise. And so I guess that that's how I'm feeling right now. I wish I could be more clear cut, but I, I really do think I'm kind of a amalgamation uh, of, uh, you know, almost Buddhist like equanimity uh, with a kind of Woody Allen uh, pervasive neuroticism. 
Sure. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's that's of course the, 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 <laughs> There's no there's no wrong answer, I think, to this question. I, I mean, I want to ask every person I meet, you know, uh, the guy at the, at the gas station, you know, the person checking me out at the grocery store. I want to ask everybody what their relationship with death is like. Right. And I think you're going to get a different answer from everyone. I, I don't think anyone's ever going to really have this the same answer as somebody else, especially dependent on, you know, someone like you or or just somebody who maybe necessarily doesn't really think about it. I feel like I struggle with the idea. I go, I'm like extremes. I yeah. go from, <laughs> I go from nothing matters. Life is pointless, but in like the enjoy it sense, yes. like nothing matters. It's all, it's just absurdity. Yeah. Enjoy your life. N nothing matters. And then I feel like I also go to, well, nothing matters. So, like, who gives a shit? And like, yeah. what? We're all gonna die one day, you know. A hundred years from now, it's gonna be all new people. No one's even gonna remember who I am. Yeah, I feel like there's like such power in that, and then such disappointment. That's and I right. never, and I never know which direction I'm really gonna go in. And it's yeah. so hard to find a middle. I mean, d does a middle ground exist in? It doesn't. Nothing really matters. Is it, does that does that exist? Yeah. Well, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to tell me. You're supposed to tell me what to do. So I. Yeah. No. 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 I, I like obsessing. Again, yeah. I. No, I like how you put it again. Heidegger, the philosopher, has a way of talking about it. He calls it like the turning, and he's like, "Look, you, you, you can be. You could get to the point where you realize that life is intrinsically meaningless." Yeah. And but that doesn't mean that it has no meaning. And so if you look at it one way, uh, it, it the fact is, is that and he's borrowing from Kierkegaard when he's like, hey, when we're conscious, that makes us aware of the possibility of possibilities. Uh, and at our best, that, that's like, great. Uh, I have this unbelievable opportunity to derive my own sense of meaning from the world and to impose some meaning on it. Well, that's good. But then Heidegger says, yeah, but you can have the same, like life has no meaning. And But if you turn 180 degrees metaphorically in the other direction, you tumble into the existential abyss. Yeah. And because you're like, I am no one and no thing. And then you're kind of uh, the main character in a Greek tragedy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it that that is such a especially nowadays, the the yeah. whole the, the main character point of view. Yeah. Um, you know, is, I think, sort of consuming a lot of people. Right. You, you know, you you try not. I was just having a conversation with a friend the other night where we were discussing, you know, just that feeling of concern and anxiety, uh, just thinking about what other people think about us That's right. and, and how much that affects the way I live my life sometimes and how at the end of the day, that's really going to be something I'm probably going to regret because, oh my God, I can't believe I wasted so much time worrying about this one specific thing. And, you know, there's this really great quote uh, from David Foster Wallace, where he says, you know, you'll stop worrying so much about what people think about you when you realize how seldom they do. That's correct. And I, I like his work. And then social psychologists have verified that experimentally. We we think people notice a lot more about us than they ever actually do. See, yeah, that's so interesting. And and it, it's it it's crazy. I, I To make life decisions based off of how other people think about you obviously in in the grand scheme of things is to to base your life around other people's feelings is kind of ridiculous in a non as non -judge judgmental as i could be about that but we all do it i mean i do it I, do. i'm guilty of it all the time and so but I, again i like your honesty and i i you know i say to my students including myself, we are all from time to time culturally constructed meat puppets marching to the beat of somebody else's drum. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't realize that from time to time and get in tune with our own rhythm.
Yeah, that I think that's that's the struggle, right? Then again, that's sort of I think where I'm at, where it's like these extremes, where I'm yeah. either I'm either at one or the other, and I'm trying to find that like middle rhythm that yeah. exists somewhere. I haven't yeah. found it yet, but it's there, but, I think. Yeah, it is there, and I like the you know a lot of our conversation has really been about. Uh, you know, some kind of harmonious balance in the middle of a continuum. And I think that's uh, closer to psychodynamic reality. I I feel like I'm working towards that. Sometimes it's it's at a very slow pace. And some days I think it's it's a little bit I'm moving a little bit quicker. But these conversations are just so helpful. And I'm really so appreciative for you to take the time to come on the podcast and, and talk to me about this stuff. I'm so excited for everybody to listen and, and, and hear this conversation. And I, I really do feel like this, this has helped. It, it's, it's great to be able to get your perspective on some of the, you know, the thoughts and feelings that I've had. I just, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and coming on the podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Um, this has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was awesome.